So that brings us to, remember our whole goal here was to come up with an alternative for expected utility theory, right? Because we said expected utility theory dealt with objective probabilities. It dealt with final levels of wealth. And we could show that that model couldn't describe the behavior that people actually exhibited. So we said we need to come up with this alternative framework when we you know, built it from the ground up. We introduced each piece one at a time. And now we're ready to put that all together. And so, you know, let's just consider an easy case where we have two possible outcomes and we call them X and Y, right? And so we have an X and a Y and then we have a P1 and a P2. Then we could say, you know, expected utility is just going to be P1 times the utility of X plus P2 times the utility of Y. And we know that P1 plus P2 is going to equal But that's just how we do expected utility. That's nothing new. That's just you know, giving us something to compare to. Then we can say, you know, we need to come up with the equivalent. We need an expected prospect value. Notice I put EPV rather than just EV because that's expected value. We already know what that is. That's something different. So I needed a different word here. And we can say expected prospect value is the analog to expected utility when we're taking this behavioral model and applying it to risky choice. And so basically what happens is when we're coming up with a formula, we're not explicitly putting these editing stages into the formula. But what we're saying instead is, hey, these editing stages are happening. And then we get as the output of those editing stages a set of prospects that we're trying to compare. Let's calculate the expected prospect value for each of those edited prospects. Okay. We, will, we have to differentiate between what we call regular prospects and what I call here other prospects. You could also call them irregular if you wanted to. Obviously, we would understand what that means. That we have a regular prospect has both a negative and positive outcome, or at least not all positive and not all negative. OK. Those statements are importantly different because one of those allows for zero potential outcome to make something a regular prospect, right? So we could say that we have a regular prospect in the context of this very simple outcomes of X and Y. We could say that we have a regular prospect if we have, you know, maybe X is greater than zero and Y is less than zero. We could have, you know, Y be the one that's greater than zero and X be less than zero. So obviously, if we have one positive and one negative outcome, something is a regular prospect. Or we can have a regular prospect if the probabilities add to less than one. Because if the probabilities add to less than one, we have an implicit possible outcome of zero in there. And if we have an implicit possible outcome of zero, then we have a prospect that's not for sure always positive or always negative. Right? So the simplest way to think about this is the regular prospects are ones that are not strictly positive and not strictly negative. And in that case, the expected prospect value formula is the same as what we've been talking about, or the analog of what we've been talking about with expected utility that we could just say, rather than take the probabilities, we're taking the decision weights, which are a function of those probabilities. And rather than taking utility, we're taking the values. You're like, oh, OK, that seems to make sense. Though we're not trying to come up with something that looks like a totally different animal, we have something that looks pretty analogous to what we were already doing with expected utility, but with these modifications. And then we'd say, you know, we do that, 
and then you add to it the decision weight that you're placing on the probability of the second outcome times the value of that second outcome. Easy. And you can see how that's directly analogous. But now we get to a situation where we have to come up with a formula for these other prospects. So these prospects where we get to a situation where our outcome is either strictly positive or strictly negative. And if the outcome is strictly positive or strictly negative, remember we said, well, we did this segregation phase, that we seem to be thinking about this guaranteed part differently, that we're not incorporating it into everything else. If we were then to just literally do the same thing here, we would be sort of ignoring the whole concept behind that segregation of the risky and the for sure. So like, oh, well in order to be true to what we talked about earlier, what we said was probably happening, we need to have a different formula for those things where we're for sure either getting a gain or a loss. So the easiest way to think about this, let's just take a situation where, let's assume that we have an all positive outcome <coughs> and that X is the smaller positive outcome and Y is the larger small larger positive outcome, not the larger smaller outcome, that would not make sense. But you could obviously do the same thing and write the formula if, for example, x was the bigger one or if you had two negative ones. Basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, in order for this formula to make sense, we need to identify which one is the more extreme outcome. Okay, so this would work. We assume either that both outcomes are positive and y is bigger than x, or this formula would look the same if we had both of these outcomes be negative and we had y be less than x because again y would be the more extreme outcome, meaning just the one that's further away from zero. So we're writing this formula such that y is the more extreme outcome and we think about well then what's happening? Well, what's happening is we're, inc we're incurring x for sure. And then we might be incurring with some probability some incremental difference between y and x, right? That if I told you you had two possible outcomes, you're going to flip a coin, you're either going to get $100 or $150. What we're saying is that you're seeing that as $100 and then a coin flip for an incremental 100 minus 50. Dollars. Okay. So not surprising we say, well, how can we think about this? Well, we're getting the value of x for sure, so it's not surprising we'd start there. And then with probability p2, right, because p2 is the probability on y. So with probability p2, we're getting some incremental amount. So we need to have the decision weight on P2 in our formula. And we say, well, what is the incremental value that we're getting? Well, with probability P2, we're getting an incremental value of V of Y minus V of X. Now, couple of things to note here. One note that I specifically wrote v of y minus v of x and not the value of y minus x. And you want to think carefully about why the formula is not written that other way. The formula is not written that other way because, you know, think about our simple example where I said you have a 50% chance of getting $50 and a 50% chance of getting $100. If I was going to say, all right, then you're getting $50 for sure, you're getting the value of 50. And then with probability P2, if I just wrote this as V of Y minus X, you'd be getting another V of 50. 
And what we'd be implicitly assuming in order for that to make sense is that in this span of this one outcome or this one choice, this one transaction, that you got this $50, you acclimated back to your reference point, and then you got another $50. And that doesn't seem particularly reasonable. It doesn't seem like within a span of just like seconds or within one transaction that you're like, oh, I've incorporated $50 into my happiness level. Oh, look, another $50. Like, people are stupid, but not that stupid. Because they knew that the, you know, that this is all part of one thing. And so what this is doing here is saying, well, we're actually taking the value of $100 and subtracting out the value of $50. That's going to give us something that's less than V of 50. Because all this is saying by formulating it this way is that we haven't acclimated back to our reference point in the middle of this transaction. Right? That if we're thinking about that incremental value that we're getting, we're thinking about the incremental value conditional on us already having gotten a gain, which is represented here. Okay. So. Does it seem useful? Does it seem helpful? Does it seem necessary to have these two different formulations? I didn't think this was particularly controversial, and then in one class, students really thought it was stupid that there were these two different formulations. Um, so, you know, let's think about this for a second. Are these two formulas the same? I'm going to ask you to go through a little bit of a, an arithmetic exercise here. Because if I were to, you know, if I were to rewrite this, especially this second one here, if I were to look at this second formula, I could mathematically and completely <coughs> validly rewrite this as 1 minus pi of p2 times v of x plus pi of p2 v of y, right? That's something I could do. And then we would notice, you know, if we were comparing these two formulas, that the second term in both of the formulas is the same. So we've got pi of p2 times v of y. And then the only difference between the two formulas is in the first one we have pi of p1 times v of x, and we have in the second one 1 minus pi of p2 times v of x. And so the student tried to argue to me that this second formula was unnecessary because these two things were the same. Why is that not correct? Um, because At the very least, we can't guarantee that they sum to one. That we can guarantee that the probabilities themselves sum to one. Remember I brought up earlier when we were talking about the, the probability weighting function, that we can't assume that the decision weights sum to one. Exactly. So these formulas are not equivalent because pi of p1 plus pi of p2, I won't say it never does, but it doesn't have to equal 1. That we said, generally speaking, in a lot of cases, the decision weights are subadditive, meaning that they sum to less than 1. We don't know that that's always true, but we don't know that they sum to 1 either. Obviously, these two formulas are equivalent when pi of p1 plus pi of p2 does, in fact, equal 1. So we can't, we can't assume that these are the same thing. We want to make sure that we're not making that error. And because of that earlier assumption, we can, in fact, see that these two different formulas <coughs> are necessary. So basically what we're saying with prospect theory is we have all these different components where now in all of the models where we put expected utility into the picture and we make the assumption that the person chooses the option with the higher expected utility, now we've presented an alternative to that to say, well now in those same models, we can put in there a model of risky choice where the individual chooses the option with the higher expected prospect value. 
and we know how those expected prospect values are calculated after those editing stages that we talked about. So, you know, we've provided our first alternative, something that can be then fed into a lot of the more traditional economic models that gives a more descriptive view of how people think about choice that involves risk and uncertainty. Ta-da!